You're listening to The Kelly Track Show. I'm your host, Kelly Track, author, coach, and eternal optimist. Each week, I'll give you lessons to elevate your life, reclaim your personal power, and truly awaken and transform. Your best life starts right now. Hey friends, welcome back. Thank you as always for tuning in and for listening. I am so excited to have you here for this guest episode today. Now, before we jump in, support for today's episode comes from Teachable. Teachable is the online course platform that I love the most. It is where my best-selling course that's totally digital lives. Uh, It's called Your Best Life, in case you haven't heard of it, but uh, you probably have because I talk about it a lot (laughs) and because you guys love it a lot. But Teachable is my favorite place to host my online classes because they make it really easy. It's plug and play. There isn't a lot of thinking. I mean, it already takes a lot of brain power from you to build an online course. So Teachable just takes care of the rest. Plus, when you sign up for Teachable with the link in the show notes, Teachable is offering you three free courses which have a thousand dollars in value that they're giving you totally free because you roll in with me to help you get your first online course off the ground, help you figure out the sound, the lighting, the audio, how to make it high res and high quality without breaking the bank, how to structure your curriculum, how to even make your online course and school and what that looks like from A to Z. So my friends, if you are a maker and a shaker, and if you are looking to grow some passive income for yourself with an online course and share your gifts with the world, Teachable is a platform I recommend time and time again, and it's the one I like to use myself. So if you're curious and you want to snag those three free courses, the link is in the show notes for you. So today on the podcast, I am so stoked to bring you Ange Simpson. She is somebody I've been following for like, honestly, forever, and I love her work so much. It is such a pleasure and an honor to have her here and get to share her with you today. And I love Ange because she shares her truth and she speaks from the heart and she's just so real and authentic. Plus this conversation is so fun. It's going to go by so quickly for you. So if you're looking for a little uplifting combo uh, to spark your day, it's Def's this one. Now, if you don't know Ange, she is the woman that runs the Gratitude Project. Maybe you've seen her on Instagram or you follow her on Facebook, but Angela Simpson is a female health and happiness coach, writer, and speaker. She is the creator of the Gratitude Project blog, which inspires thousands of women to step into their light and live their best life. Angela is also the mind behind 30 Days of Self-Care and the Gratitude Transformation course and has added cacao-filled joy into many kitchens with her recipe book, Treat Your Taste Buds. Through her time as an integrative nutrition health coach, Angela has coached dozens of women personally through her private coaching practice and hundreds more with her online program. Angela is 100% committed to giving women the tools to completely change their lives through small acts of gratitude, tweaks in nourishing their bodies, and the power to create what they desire in their relationships, career, and personal lives. Gratitude turns what we have into enough. Sometimes we just need to clear the fog to see the magic right in front of us. So my friends, this is a super fun and beautiful conversation today with Ange, and I hope you love it just as much as I do. Well, welcome to the show, Ange. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yay. So as I was sharing with you before, I've been following you since you had that watercolor purple logo. Oh my God. Yeah. Do you know what? I, I look back at that. I had like these cards made and everything and I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> and it's so funny how at the time I was like, wow, like I know pretty. And I think <laughs> back then that it was so pretty. And now I look at it and I'm like, what? wow, what was I doing? <laughs> I totally know how you feel. I actually think that it like looking back, I think it looks still pretty, but I know how you feel. Cause like when I look back at past work I've done and you look at it through like another lens, you're like, I thought that was like the total shit and like the bee's knees. And now I like (laughs) think it's like garbage. I'm like, that cannot even be on my website. Like get that out of here. I love it. Yeah. But yeah, I've been, I remember reading it like literally on the first iPad that we ever bought, like the first gen iPad. So I don't know how many years ago that was, but many moons ago. (laughs) Wow. I think it was about, I think that that website was about three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. 
it's it, on one hand sometimes I feel like oh my god I've been doing this forever but when I say like I think I've been doing it like five years and when I say that I'm like that's not that long really but at the same time it feels like forever so yeah strange. I totally know yeah. how you feel yeah so I know it's morning over there for you so well it's like midday almost but so drop me yeah. into the first hour of your day this morning and what did you eat for breakfast Oh, okay. This morning. So we have a one-year-old and she doesn't really sleep well through the night. So last night was like, we're trying to teach her how to sleep. So I haven't had a lot of sleep. Um, but I woke up this morning with both of my girls in my bed and we always have like cuddle time. That's like our main thing. Like no matter what, no matter if they slept in their own bed or they slept in our bed, as soon as we wake up, we all cuddle. Um, and then I took, Hugh went surfing, my husband, Hugh went surfing and my girls and I went out and I do this yoga with my oldest little girl, Bo. She's almost five. Um, a woman on Spotify called Kira Wiley, she has really great yoga songs. So I do a couple of sun salutations while Bo listens to her yoga music and she does like kids yoga. It's really cute Mm because, um, the girl who films it, like she directs the kids, but in a way that makes a lot of sense to them. So there's like one about baking an apple pie and they like pick the apples from the apple tree. So they have to like reach up high to get it. And it's, it's really cool. It's a really cool soundtrack. So we did that. And then we got Bo ready for school. I had a green smoothie for breakfast, which I have pretty much every day. I'm a creature of habit. And then I got to work. (laughs) Nice. I, lo- I love that. I love the kids yoga. That's so cute. It's so cute. It's the best. Yeah. And then I know that you, you and Hugh are really into routines. And I know Hugh has his book, R- Rule Your Routines. So do you guys have any yes. like, really <laughs> specific things that you do like in the morning or throughout the day? I'm just super curious. Do you know what we both do? I've been having some discussions with some friends about this lately, though, and I feel like everyone in this wellness world you know, we all kind of talk about our routines, but I think that it's so important these days that we're really open and honest about the fact that no one is perfect. And like, while we have our desired daily routine, it doesn't happen every day, Mm -hmm. um, especially when having kids. So ideally, like, you know, yoga and stretching is something that we love to do. We both like to meditate. So you know, like I'll watch the girls and Hugh will go sit on the balcony and do it. I like to meditate indoors because I'm, I get very disturbed very easily. So if a car drives past or I hear a bird or, you know, I see that, you know, I can hear our neighbor coming home. I'm, I'm very easily taken out of it. So I go and sit actually in Harper's room to do mine. Um, we both like guided meditation. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it's all the usual things, you know, like tongue scraping and body brushing and, you know, moving our bodies and all of those bits and pieces. But yeah, one thing that I really want to debunk in the wellness world is that like, we're not all sitting around having like the exact, like we don't all wake up at like 5.30 and do the exact same routine every day. I think it's just the fact of having that intention that, you know, there are things that, you know, make you feel good. And look, some days I wake up and I scroll Instagram on my phone and some days I wake (laughs) up and roll out of bed and do yoga. But it's really about kind of tuning in and going, what do I need today? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And you're so right. Like, I mean, everybody always wants like the, like the, what's the new routine? Yeah. It's so true. Like it totally, there's like the rituals that set you up for success. And then there's like, you know, going with the flow. And sometimes you just have time to do one. Sometimes you have time to only do like (laughs) 0.5 and like whatever is good is good. Yeah. And I, do you know what, the one thing that I, I do love is I love, um, or one thing that I don't ever miss is when I need to get into state. So like if I have a coaching call and like I said, you know, we've got a non-sleeping baby that we're trying to teach how to sleep. So like didn't sleep much last night and to be in the right state for a call like this, I mean, my natural way of being right now would be, I'm kind of tired. I'm kind of run down, but obviously I want to give everything to you in this moment. And if I had a coaching client, it would be the same thing. So I love one of my rituals when I have calls and things, I always put music on. I think music is such a great way to put yourself in a, in the right place that you need to be in. So like for me at the moment, I might sound like a full loser right now, but I really like The Greatest Showman. (laughs) Um, And so I I listen to one of the songs from that and I dance around the house before I'm going to do a call so that I'm in the right state to be 
as as much service to someone as I can be. So I think that, you know, apart from routines, rituals like that are also equally as important, you know? Yeah, I'm so with you on that one. I'm really big into that concept too. I don't know if you listen to Jess Lively at all or like dabble in like law of attraction stuff much, but this concept of like getting into alignment before taking action or as like what Tony Robbins would describe as like getting into the yeah, peak state or like state. I'm super into that too. Like yeah. I definitely like prime myself before going into anything. Like if I have anything important, it's like there's a special lead up and like just doing things that make me feel really good to like make sure I'm in the right space mm-hmm. versus like hopping on. You're totally right. Like a coaching client call and being like yeah. tired or depleted, but yeah, that space to fill up my cup first. So I love what you shared. Yeah, I totally get it. And I think, um, I think like you said, that law of attraction, I think if you already radiate the energy that you want to attract, it kind of gets to you a lot easier. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, Like if you're mm -hmm. already like radiating like happiness and positivity and abundance and prosperity, it's kind of like the universe is like, you know, like attracts like, it'll be like, oh, she's, she's got what we want. Like, let's, let's hook onto her and give her more of the good stuff. I love that. I think so too. (laughs) That's my take on it as well. Yeah, I love it. So I want to start off with what you are known for um, is all like all about gratitude. So how do you really tap into that gratitude and appreciation for what you already have, like in the current moment in order to see things differently? Yeah, look, I think one thing that, you know, a misconception about gratitude quite often is that it's all about the good and it's all about seeing what you do have. And it's all about, you know, oh, rainbows and sparkles and sunshines and fairies. but Really, the magic of gratitude comes when you find it in a way that you encourage growth. So for me, I found gratitude because I like at first it was like first world problems. You know, I had a newborn back then and I was like, oh, my gosh, life is hard. You know, she hates the car and I have to take her to the chiropractor because she's got a funny neck and she cries at the chiropractor and life is so hard. And I remember getting into it because I I kind of, I was on my way to a chiropractor and I stopped (laughs) the car and I stopped myself and I was like, oh my God, you're being such a sook. Like, what do you have to be grateful for right now? And first of all, I have a child, which is something that so many people would give their right arm for. And I have a car to take me to a healthcare professional that I can afford to pay to fix my daughter's neck. And all these things came up. Um, And that was like sort of my first baby steps into it. And then I started to really look at the things that, you know, haven't or have appeared to have not served me in my life. And I realized that out of everything that at the time I really struggled with or things that were like, you know, universal challenges for me, when I look back at them, I can always see why they had to happen and the part of me that had to grow and and the gratitude that came from that. And I just started to realize that when I chose gratitude for the good and the bad it changed the way I looked at my life and I think you know there are so many ways to do it there's you know the gratitude journals and all the bits and pieces but the really powerful way for me and something that I try and do regularly is you know sitting and writing either a letter to a person or journaling about an experience and I always say it's true gratitude when you're brought to tears And I know that if I sit and, you know, I could do it now, I could talk to you about my husband and, you know, I could easily rattle off. Yeah, I'm grateful for him because, you know, he, he quit corporate life to support me in my dreams. And, you know, he's such a great dad and all these bits and pieces. But if I go really deep into my soul and think about the real reasons why I'm grateful for him, I will be a sobbing mess. And to me, that is like true gratitude through and through. And I think that it's really important that people can kind of have those moments, however often possible. I mean, I know it's not easy to cry every day, but, you know, having those moments where you're like, I'm actually feeling such intense gratitude for either a person or an experience or a situation that I can't physically control the emotions that are coming out of me right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that really answers your question, but that's kind of my take. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's gorgeous. And I think that's such a beautiful way to explain it. Like having gratitude that is so true and like honest to your soul that it makes you well up in tears Mm. because when I get into like my deepest state of like gratitude and appreciation, I'll like kind of like get kind of choked up. And sometimes like my ego will be like, why are you getting so choked up? But like my (laughs) my soul is like, just let it out. Like, this is so lovely. And like, I love this so much or like, I enjoy this so much. And like, I'm so 
appreciative to have this. I like the word appreciation better than gratitude. Mm. So I'm, I just kind of like mm. flip flop between those terms. But yeah, I really liked what you shared because finding that one piece that makes you get so emotionally happy about it and that's just so honest and true is just like a really great nugget I think listeners mm. could walk away with rather than just being like you know write down three things that you're grateful for every single day yeah that can be kind of a little bit like airy fairy but I love that nugget so thank you all right mm -hmm. I hope it helps someone someone can go off and write a letter right now and let yourself cry and you're right what you said before so often we hold it back like usually when I finish a coaching series with a client there's like you know I always kind of have this feeling of like oh my god like you know what we've been through together and I'm so grateful that I got to experience their growth with them and I feel like I want to cry and you're right my ego pops in and they're like be cool like my ego is like don't cry because yeah. you're gonna look like a weirdo and like <laughs> you got another call in a minute you can't be like you know a sobbing mess like get it together and you know when I think about it now I'm like I should just let the tears flow because it would also help the other person I think yeah I read this really beautiful blog post by one of my coaches years ago she's a goal coach her name's Jackie Carr and she wrote this post years ago about like how she was really holding it in when she wanted to like express love publicly like in a ice cream shop to her husband and then it, she was kind of like questioning like why do we do this like why do we just like hold ourselves back from going that extra mile and just like feeling it for real and like out loud and like in public and um, mm. that really just changed my thoughts on things of you know like why don't I just like express what needs to be expressed and like it feels sometimes so good to let it out but then yeah the ego will just play all sorts of stories <laughs> so I totally get it yeah mm -hmm. yeah I think on this topic of gratitude like so many people get caught up in this story of there not being enough mm -hmm. and this like huge scarcity mindset so do you have any tools that you use to draw on gratitude in order to like shift out of that scarcity mindset of like not enough money or time or vacations or holidays and into that state of abundance? Look, I think, I mean, if you've got a scarcity mindset, it's definitely worth looking into where that's come from. And if there's been a time when maybe things were scarce and, and really checking in with the situation, then I think it's really important to also like on the other side of the same coin go, okay, when is the time that I have felt super abundant? When is a time that I have felt like there was enough to go around? And, you know, often if I work with people around, you know, food issues, a lot of the time when, you know, there's cravings or binges happening, it's because there was a time in their life when food was quite scarce, whether that was, you know, their brothers ate really fast and always got seconds and they didn't, or maybe, you know, they were only allowed to have one piece of chocolate a week and it was a special thing or whatever it could be. I think reminding yourself and sort of retraining your brain to the fact that there is so much abundance and you have experienced it in your life before and like actually sitting in almost like a meditative state where you connect back in with a time when that has been true so you know if you've just gone through a breakup or something and obviously you're feeling like all men are dickheads and you're never <laughs> going to find <laughs> a nice guy because all men are assholes it's kind of like tune into a time when, you know, you either were speaking to someone who was really kind or you felt really loved and appreciated. And, and again, like attracting that energy so it comes back to you. But I mean, like you have to just, I mean, from a really practical point of view, there is enough to go around. There's enough money, there's enough food, there's enough people, there's enough love. Like from a really practical perspective, when you really put your mind to it, like there is so much of everything. There's no reason why we could fail. And you look at, you know, again, like looking for proof, look for the examples of when someone has had, you know, no advantage or no reason for being where they are, except for maybe hard work and, and belief and, you know, dedication to what they want to achieve. I think that if you can find proof of other people getting something like I always think about people like my husband loves the rock he thinks he's like what's his real name uh, Dwayne Johnson oh, Dwayne, yeah <laughs> yeah he thinks he's like the coolest person in the world he's always like you know Dwayne Johnson had 17 dollars in his pocket and now he's like you know and I always think to myself like there are so many examples of you know when people have overcome adversity to have what they have or find what they found that it's kind of almost impossible to put such an absolute on there's not enough of something for me. Um, so yeah, I think looking for that proof and then remembering a time when you actually felt it just to kind of rewire the brain, you know? Mm -hmm. I really like that. That's a really 
good piece of wisdom that looking for not just examples, but like past examples that you've already lived. I think that's so yeah. powerful because that just gives you like, it's like almost like bonus proof because you've lived it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good one. And then how would you use like gratitude to really like shift in the moment when like shit really hits the fan? Like when things are going AWOL or you feel like things are totally going downhill. Do you ever draw on gratitude for that? Yeah, but I mean, I think like step one is like go crazy and be pissed off. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> yeah. Enjoy the emotion of like frustration or anger and really feel it and get into it because you know, so often people will say to me like, oh, you know, I, you know, maybe it's like anxiety or something. And they go, when I'm in it, like the last thing I want to focus on in gratitude. And I think that our body needs to sometimes release emotions before it can go into gratitude and it can go into appreciation. And I think that feeling what you got to feel first is so important because mm -hmm. the other stuff won't fully compute if you don't. But otherwise, I think, you know, having again when you're in that state it's difficult to be like I'm so grateful and things are so lovely so I mean having you know I, I have a list in my phone and well I have a lot of lists in my phone but <laughs> I have a couple specifically that are like for certain things so I know that when it's like you know when my cycle's coming I know what works when mm. my cycle is coming mm -hmm. I know what foods to eat I know what oils to use. I know what supplements I need more of, what I need less of. I know that I don't book things in. So, you know, there are certain things there that I know work. I, like I've got proof. It's happened before. I'm like, okay, this is my go-to list. And same with things like if I'm ever feeling in a state of like anxiety or scarcity or something like that, I have these lists where I know that if I go to them, you know, maybe they will have either A, things that work, smells that work, places that make me feel better, act activities or exercise that make me feel better, but also like stories and examples that usually will bring me out of state. So if I'm ever feeling like sometimes we can all, we all go through this. Sometimes you can be a brat. And sometimes I'm like, eh, things didn't go my way. And sometimes <laughs> I just need to be, first of all, reminded of the amount of times that things have definitely gone my way because for all of us to be like, eh, nothing ever works for me is just self-indulgent kind of bullshit. Mm -hmm. We need to remind ourselves that life works in our favor so often. But also then reminding myself of like, okay, well, what does it really look like for things to not go my way? Because there are people in this world who are sold into sex slavery and there are people in this world who are born into abusive families. And if I really want to bitch and moan, I can go into that list and see examples of how things do go my way and how things could be a lot worse. And so, you know, I think that a part of it is about using gratitude, but it's also about bringing yourself back into the moment, kind of being like, you know, a friend of mine. And I love her to death. She's my best friend, but she flew from Sydney to the Gold Coast with her two kids. And she was talking to someone and she's like, oh my God, it's so hard being on a plane with two kids. And I'm like, babe, that's not hard. I'm like, you want me to talk about things that are hard, not from experience, but like there are things that are really hard. And I'm like, sometimes you just have to kind of check yourself and change your perception because sometimes we do get a little bit indulgent with what our heart is. And I think it's so worth feeling it and having that moment. But then it's also about putting it in perspective and being like, okay, what is really hard in the world? Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's so empowering and such a important lens and a view that I think so many people don't tap into like people get so they are like I mean people love their stories and sometimes like mm -hmm. oh I know that like I love my stories and like my ego loves my stories like let me get that one straight them. yeah my ego loves yeah. my stories and they're just having that perspective shift and I think that's great what you shared so thank you I also wanted to ask you about kind of like pivoting in in the conversation and talking to you about cultivating self-love and then also love and the expression of loving others in relationships so i uh, i also love your youtube videos just fyi <laughs> watched i'll just go like out myself i've like watched all of those too uh, in <laughs> obviously oh big my god big and fan over <laughs> here it. but um yeah one of my favorite videos that you did was actually the recent one with melissa ambrosini about her new book mm -hmm. open wide and you guys were talking about how expectations ruin relationships. I would love for mm -hmm. you to just deep dive on this a little bit. Oh my God. I could, I could deep dive for hours on this, but I'll try and keep it short and snappy. <laughs> um, 
look, at the end of the day, I think all relationships and I mean, look, if we use female relationships as an example, like I know that for me, I have expectations that I set on my friendship, you know, call me on my birthday, Um, (laughs) you know, like be there for me if I need you, all these little bits and pieces, like the big things, like, you know, be a friend, be there for the big life events, care about me, love me, all those things, but also like the little expectations of, you know, if I'm acting a certain way, they should act a certain way, or if I'm needing this, they should be there. And the thing is, we're all going through such different experiences at, at such a different pace. Um, and I think that when we have expectations on, yeah, say our female friendships like that, we kill them because if they don't live up to them, we think that they're at fault without actually looking at the fact that they're not at fault. We put an expectation on them that they did not agree to, that they did not even know about in most cases. And we went, okay, this is how this person should act, you know, without taking into account their own personality traits, their past experiences, what they're going through currently. We don't usually take that stuff into account. We just say, I think this is what a good friend should be. So I'm going to expect you to do that. And I think that what happens then is we kind of set people up for failure. And also that, you know, again, that self-indulgent, like I'm right, she's wrong. This Mm -hmm. is bullshit. Things aren't working in my favor. You know, she should do this. He should do this. And you know, I think if we go into every relationship knowing that people are on their own journey and to just love and appreciate them how they are, but also having really open and honest conversations, like, you know, about boundaries and about what you would love to see from a friendship. You know, I think that's Mm -hmm. really important. I've definitely had friends in the past who, because I'm a coach, they can Mm -hmm. sometimes use that to their advantage. And every call is like a, a session. And I, you know, I've had to say to a lot of friends, you know, I love you and I appreciate you, but like, I don't want to feel like you're a client. I want you to be a friend. And sometimes this needs to be a two way street. And once that was communicated, everything was fine. You know, it was, again, it was the fact they had a certain expectation on me that had never been vocalized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, it's really about open communication and same with relationships with a partner. You know, we often go into like what our Prince Charming is and maybe they don't know that we have all these expectations on them and I've always been good with communication because my parents are very good with communication and I think that you know like when I went into our marriage when we started when Hugh and I started dating seriously I had to straight up say to him you know my dad when I was a child traveled a lot and I didn't see him much and I resented him for that and I refuse to have children with someone who thinks that that's okay a career is never more important than your family Yes, we need money to get by, but I don't want my girls to grow up with what I grew up with. And I was really straightforward with it. So from the beginning, he knew, you know, leaving home at seven in the morning and getting home at seven at night was not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, you know, I think that the main thing about these expectations is that if there is something that you need, you have to tell someone, you can't just expect people to know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. So important. I had this like aha moment back at the holiday season when I realized like the same sort of thing went with expectations, but with like boundaries, like unspoken boundaries. Like I realized I had these mental boundaries in my head and I was like, oh my God, why did these people not get it? Like I've explained this so many times. And then I had to like have a check-in and I was like, is this just like something you're telling yourself? Like how you actually vocalized this? Have Mm -hmm. you actually said that you have this boundary or like this expectation of like how things need to be? And I realized I I like I didn't it's like um my mother and I do not share the same brain (laughs) and like you have to (laughs) totally vocalize it otherwise it feels like you are reading one page of the book and the other person is reading like the last chapter yeah like um excuse me how come you can't see it like I see it Mm -hmm. also can you share about what you would do if you were working with a client who had just a ton of expectations that they had just put on themselves that they have actively taken on Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like I have to coach myself. <laughs> I <laughs> Fair, think, me too. I think um, it, re- it depends on the situation. I had a big realization um, during a meditation a few days ago, actually, that when I was young, I used to dance and I, I did every type of dance there was. I did ballet. I did tap. I did jazz. I did contemporary. I did whatever you could do. I would do. Um, and I remember one year, I like we always had the end of year concert and I was in 13 different 
performances and that was more than anyone in the entire dance school and I was like you know everyone was like oh my god like so many costumes you have to remember so many performances I remember the pride that I felt in the fact that I was doing so much and everyone was like wow like that's crazy like no one else can do that much how are you remembering it and you're incredible and I loved that phrase of being able to juggle so much and I've carried that through my life where I love being able to be like the mom who works who you know keeps a clean home and like Mm -hmm. all these kind of you know some Mm -hmm. significant some really insignificant things but I I really like I've always wondered why I take such pride in doing so much and I think it's you know, for me, it is an expectation. It's like, well, you can, so you should. And it really, like for me, it's been about looking over these past few days since I had that realization. It's been about looking over the places in my life where I feel like I want to overperform and figuring out how it's serving me because it is obviously serving me. It's serving my ego. It's serving, you know, our finances. It's serving whatever it is, but also looking at where maybe some parts aren't serving me and figuring out you know why I still feel the need to do certain things or if it's worth it and I'm always going to be someone who wants to do everything I'm always going to be someone who you know when you mentioned my YouTube I was like oh like I haven't YouTubed in ages like I really okay so next week I'm going to schedule in to like film some YouTube videos and like it's when you know for me it's when I try and fit all these extra things on that I do kind of feel I get very emotionally overwhelmed and I shut down a lot and I you know I I had a post last week or the week before I think last week on my Instagram about the fact that lately I've emotionally shut down because you know social media can be such a fickle place and people can be really cruel and I had shut down a lot from vulnerability and it was literally just the fact that I'm putting too much on my plate and I wasn't making space for it. So in the places where I was being served by working a lot and being super social, I was being served there, but I wasn't serving myself in the way that I was pushing down, you know, the desire to be really open and honest with people on my social media channels and on my news, my newsletter and things like that. And that to me, when I realized that that was happening, I went, okay, well, no, this has to change because I really pride myself on being real to lots of people and not portraying like hey this is the perfect life of a perfect health coach with a perfect family but I want to be like hey she she goes down sometimes it's not always good um so yeah I think once you realize what it is that you're sacrificing and really question like is that worth sacrificing do I want to let go of that and you know for me I was like no I don't want to let go of that like I love my I love my people I love showing people that it's not all rainbows and sparkles and butterflies so yeah I think The short answer to that question um, would be, I think, yeah, check in what you're missing, where you're being served and and what you're sacrificing and work out if it's worth it. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful to think about the concept of what you're sacrificing in order to get that, like, yeah, the gold star or the shiny penny that you're chasing. Mm. Mm. I'm like you where I was definitely praised just in school, like from high school teachers or elementary school teachers on like overachieving and really over accomplishing and like going above and beyond um to the point where that was a pattern that I still have to work on because it's like an easy thing to grab because yeah like my ego loves that approval or would just keep Mm. seeking that um and to having to like have that check-in of like okay well what am I sacrificing when I do that do I really want to keep sacrificing like my relationships with my friends or my family or my partner Chris and like in turn for what, like more hours of work? Like, is it really worth Mm -hmm. it for like chasing Mm -hmm. some sort of old story that I had from like, oh my God, it was like grade, grade seven. Yeah. When I got really praised from Mm -hmm. a school teacher. Um, so yeah, I think that's such a powerful nugget of wisdom. And then I know you had also shared in the video that you were doing with Melissa about how you started like cultivating this self-love that you had for yourself. And it kind of came through the evolution of you loving you, Mm. because I thought that was such a powerful thing because I felt like that really resonated with me because self-love was not something that I did so well. Like it was something I was getting better at, but I really started understanding love and like how to love myself when like my partner, Chris, and like him starting to love me and doing it through Mm. that lens. So can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah. And I mean, like so many, I think, and I think it's really, um, 
I think what people are saying is right, that you need to love yourself first, but it's not always the case. And like I was saying to Melissa, like, you know, I didn't love myself first. I, I found my greatness through his eyes and that is really special and unique. And I think that, you know, I think that in the world of wellness in general, there's no one size fits all. So mm-hmm. like, you know, like, like that concept of like, you can only love, you know, be loved by others when you love yourself. It's not always true right? Like I was loved before I loved myself. And I think that, you know, we all need to go into, you know, reading and like listening to things and go, you know what, like even everything I say, I am not Bible. Like what I say is not a hundred percent truth, you know, for everyone it's truth for me and being able to really check in with your life and going, okay, what actually resonates with me? And, And in situations like that, you know, I look at you and my relationship, I was so young, like I was 16 when I met him and you know, he had lived a life 10 years ahead of me and he had experienced a lot. And, you know, I was still finding myself. I didn't know what self-love was. I was still like doing my head that I was a size 26 in jeans instead of a size 24. And, you know, all these stupid, ridiculous little, you know, insecurities and Mm -hmm. not thinking I was cool. And, you know, I, especially, you know, turning 18, we can drink and go clubbing here when we're 18. Um, not 21, like in America. How old is it in Canada? It's 19. It's 19. Yeah, legal drinking age. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um, when I turned 18, you know, a lot of people in my friendship groups were, you know, dabbling in drugs and drinking a lot and I didn't drink and I, I never wanted to take drugs. It was just not my thing. I was like, you know, I, I don't know if I can thank my parents for that, but I just, I was never interested in altering my state in that way. I really felt like I wanted to have fun by just being happy. But that also brought up a lot of insecurities with me. And I was with you at the time. And, you know, he was a really, he was an incredible guiding force for me there because I felt really insecure in the fact that I was being left out a lot because I wasn't, you know, taking drugs. I wasn't doing these things that a lot of people do at that age, which is sad, but true. But I was feeling really insecure. And there have been a lot of times when I have felt um, very alone in that way because I've done things a little bit differently to people. You know, that's one example. Another one is, you know, I met the love of my life at 16 and we got married when I was like 22 or 23 and did everything quite young. Um, and so I've always, you know, had these moments where I haven't loved myself and I felt very unloved by a lot of other people. And he and my really close friends have always been the ones that bring me back to me and he allowed me to love myself by him just loving me so unconditionally Mm -hmm. you know what I mean like Mm -hmm. nothing I could really do was something that would make him not love me I've never felt like he's sort of you know ever our love has never been compromised by my actions he knows my heart he knows what I am and he allowed me to fall in love with myself as well by kind of putting the mirror in my face of you know this is what you really are. And I think that sometimes we do need an outside person to show us that because there are, you know, sometimes you're really too close. And I know that that's why people thrive on having coaches like you and I, because we can say to them, like, this is, you know, your perception of yourself is a little bit skewed. It's very possible because when you're too close, sometimes you can't see the beauty, mm-hmm. you know, it's mm-hmm. like, what, what do they say? A Picasso or something, or one of those paintings, like when you, I think it's from Clueless, when you stand up close <laughs> or I don't know. But yeah, sometimes you just can't see clearly when you're too close to it. And I think that's the same about ourselves. And I know that, yeah, for me, having you to really just love me so unconditionally allowed me to love myself, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. I just so appreciate that you shared that because it was the first time I had ever heard somebody else say it like that. Because every every other like self-love thing I've ever listened to or found, it's always been like, you know, love yourself first and then, and then you meet your partner or whatever. And I always kind of felt like it was like sort of untrue. And I'm like, well, what about the other way around? I kind of thought I was the black sheep. Like my partner, Chris, he's like definitely my soulmate, but my ego definitely had a story about it. Oh, like you didn't really love yourself. And like right at the beginning, you know, and it was like, oh, are you even deserving of this? And like, are you worthy of it? And um, it was such a big part of my path and my journey towards loving myself of like having this person who I thought was like, way out of my league like love me in order to see that beauty inside of me so yeah I just so appreciated you you sharing that and like sharing that openly which I think is a big deal yeah thanks (laughs) you're welcome (laughs) um I also wanted to touch on 
this topic of relationships with other women. Um, as I know, mm. I know you're really good friends with Kate Cattle, who was on the show. Her episode was yes. one of the most popular on the podcast. Yay! Yay! Because she's so awesome. She is. She's amazing. <laughs> I love her work as well. Um, she just speaks so much truth. I feel like, yeah. yeah, everybody that's listened to that episode has told me so many kind, loving words about how much they loved it. Um, because it's everybody, everybody needs to learn that stuff. Self-comparison is so huge. Yeah. So I know that you had a journey from being at that all women's event that you shared on YouTube once mm. to being at this place now where you run the gratitude gang, you have these beautiful and deep nourishing connections with other women. You work with all these beautiful female coaching clients. Can you share more about your evolution and your journey from the start to where you are at now and how you thrive with female relationships? Yeah. I mean, look, I think, you know, we all have our, our stories around women and mine was definitely, um, I actually Googled it one night. <laughs> I think I said in the video, it's called gynophobia when you're afraid of women, mm. which I find funny because mm -hmm. gyno, gynecologist, mm -hmm. all those things. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't actually realize it until one night I was at dinner with Kate and one of our friends, Tess, and you know, we were kind of, somehow we got into like, a, you know, let's coach and session with that, like so unintentionally. And I was like, oh my God, I'm just terrified of females. And it was really showing in that time of my life. Like I, I had my coaching practice, but I was really disconnected from anything else. I didn't, you know, I didn't connect with women the way I do now. I didn't, I wasn't comfortable going to networking events. I wasn't comfortable. You know, if someone said, Hey, come hang out with me and my friends, I'd be like, no, no, no. And mm -hmm. I went to an all girls school. And of course, like things happen at all girls schools where yeah. there's bitchiness and there's a lot of competitiveness. And I remember like I intentionally would sit with a different group of people every day of the week. And I can see now that I was just staying at arm's length from connecting really deeply with people. And I would have friendships where I would, it would go in hard and fast and I would be really good friends with one or two people. And then it would just dissipate and I would go and be friends with someone else. And like on, on one hand I was like, Oh, like people don't get me or I'm, I'm a bit too weird. You know, I was always kind of funny and like, you know, I, I always just thought it was like, Oh yeah, people don't get me. Like I'm going to blame the rest of the world. But really I was just protecting myself because I had seen the nasty side of female friendship mm -hmm. and I had put a blanket stereotype and been like, that is female. Females are bitches. They're out to get you. They don't lift you up They're, You know, it's, it's not safe. And like every part of my body was like, abort the mission. Like do not mm -hmm. go near. Mm -hmm. Like females are awful. And I still have a tendency to, be friendlier with like you know my husband's friends or like with males I love guys not in like a way that mm -hmm. I want to like date them I just always think I find it easier sometimes to talk to them because they're still that part of me but um you know finding friends like Kate Kate and I've been friends for about three or four years um finding people like that and really pushing myself out of my comfort zone to be like oh my gosh you're safe you're totally safe here and again rewiring that thought pattern like we were talking about before like sometimes you have to rewire your beliefs and kind of go okay well is this true or is this a story that I've been telling myself and now I'm like oh my god I get it like women are amazing and not all of them some of them are terrifying but like in general like attracts like and again if my intention is always going to be to attract women that you know, want to, want to create the same type of life that I do, where there's constant growth, where there's abundance, where there's support, where there's real emotions, like raw, hysterical, sobbing emotions. And that's something I still struggle with. I definitely struggle with being vulnerable in front of people. Um, but you know, I think that if the intention is there, you do, you attract the right people. And when I met Kate, I was calling that in desperately because I was very lonely and I was starting an online business and no one understood what I was going through. And, you know, from the very beginning, my intention was to make this huge. And, you know, a lot of my friends were, you know, the same place that I was a year before that, which is, I just want to have babies and do Pilates and like go shopping and do like do mm -hmm. mum life. And something really shifted in me. And I think it was, it was all how it was meant to be, you know, like we Hugh quit his job and he retired so that we could be together and he could be a really present dad. And I think that all of this was leading up to that. Um, and I didn't have anyone in my life that really understood that journey. So for me, um, I needed her. I needed Kate. She was definitely like my step 
into more authentic female friendships. And I had amazing female friends, but even speaking to them now, they know that there's a shift in me where I'm a lot more human, a lot more open, a lot more emotional to them because I feel safe again. Whereas before that, I loved them to death and I adored my female friends, but I was definitely afraid to show them the real me. Because mm-hmm. what if they hated it? <laughs> yeah, well, totally. I mean, that yeah. that piece about being vulnerable, like I feel like it's, I feel like for me, I mean, it's so easy for me to be vulnerable on my podcast or whatever, um, mm. but like totally that in-person bit, it's still... I love that you share that because it's like, it's even still like, I'm always like, oh my God, I'm already, I'm this far. And sometimes it's still like in, in that moment of in-person, it's like, okay, be vulnerable, like be open. It is okay. So I really appreciate your story with, with Kate and how that has happened over time. And then for people that are uh, new to you and Kate, can you also share a little bit more about what you guys are making there over with the Gratitude Gang? Yeah. So we look, I think it was about this time last year, um, I just went through a complete transition in my life. I had just had my second daughter and I was really not in a good place. I was physically and emotionally, I was like, not, not looking after myself because I was so focused on looking after Harper. And I was like, I need to be a really present mom to Bo. And I also need to be a wife and oh my God, like, you know, my business supports the family. So I need to be working. I need to be coaching and I need to be doing all these things. And I became really unwell. And then, you know, I'm passionate, so passionate about whole foods and whole food nutrition. So I got really into, I think when Harper was about six weeks old, I was like, right, there's got to be a better way. And I got really into healing myself again. And I was like, you know what? There are so many women who are in this situation. And two of the situations I was in actually, one where they're not taking care of themselves and where they're really depleted. And another one where maybe they're a mom and they don't know what their purpose is. Because I think these days as women, we're told we can have it all and do it all, but we are nurturers and we need to be with our babies. And for a lot of us, maternity leave is, you know, eight months or so. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is there, but you know, we yeah, get paid for eight months and then, yeah, we maybe have to go back to work. And I think that that's so unnatural for us to be taken away from our children at a young age, but it's so necessary for some people these days. There's just, there's not another choice. It's like we go from having two incomes and two people and we figure out how to live that way. And then we have a baby and all of a sudden we've got three people and one income. Mm-hmm. And it's like, how on earth is that supposed to work? And so in the gang, basically, you know, it is a space where we support with both. It's like, you want to get healthy and look after your body. We're totally there. And we're in the process of creating something really amazing, which I can't announce yet, but I will eventually. So amazing. watch this space. Um, and then on the second hand, it's like, okay, can, can you create something from home where you can contribute to the household, where you can, you know, like for some people, they think about it and they go, you know what, I really want to, you know, just have money to go food shopping every week. Or, you know what, I really want to contribute half half to the household finances. Or you can be a crazy person like me and go, you know what, I want to bring my husband home because I don't want him to be stressed anymore. I don't want him to have to bear the grunt of working in a space where he's not happy. And, you know, whatever the goal is, it's just a group of women and we all support and love each other to do that. And, you know, I think again, it's back getting really clear on what you want to create, which is something I'm just, I'm so into at the moment is I just want women to go, you know what, if, if you could, if you could absolutely consciously construct your perfect life, what would it look like? And I know for me, like I have my husband home, like he's, you know, I'm in the bedroom right now. He's out there with Harper playing with her. And for me, that's something that I visualized. I really wanted him to be in a space where she would equally go to him or me. It wasn't like, no, you're the mom. So she's going to go to you. Mm-hmm. You know, he's changed more nappies. He puts her, you know, while we're doing this sleep training, he's the one in with her, helping her. Like we equally contribute to parenting her. And for me, that was something that I felt like I don't see very often, but I wanted to create more of. And it has become a little bit of a passion of mine to try and find women who want the same thing as well. And look, you don't have to want to bring your husband home to be in the gang, but I'm like, you know what? That like, To me, if someone says to me, you know what, my husband is stressed, his health is suffering, I want him to be with my family all the time, I want us to do this thing called life together, then I'm like, oh my God, like I'm here, I can't carry you to it, but I'm definitely going to run with you. Like, let, like, show me what you need and let's do this together. I Mm -hmm. think that 
nothing's cooler you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I really I love that and I love that story and it's also I think so important to also like say say what you really want and like go big I know you were like oh I'm gonna sound like a crazy person but I love that I love a possibility is one of my core values and I think it's so important to like Mm -hmm. be like a dreamer and also like say it out loud and like share it like share share your audacious plans and visions and goals because there's other people that are seeking it just like you and it's like when one person steps up and shares like this is my dream like to bring my husband home and like have him be at home working with me and like like hanging out with like Harper and Bo and like not having to be in the corporate Mm. world anymore and that really enables other people to stand up and share like this is my big vision so yeah I love that so this is a good spot for us to start wrapping up this call so just a final couple quick q a before before you head off so yes what would you say to someone who is like just starting out on this journey of like self-development and coming to their truth i think it's really important to get clear on what the stories are that you're telling yourself in every way Mm -hmm. um and look, I love, I, I'm really getting into tapping at the moment. I'm doing mm. a course on um, EFT nice. and tapping. And I think that, you know, for me, I wish I, I wish I had this tool at the beginning, but then at the same time, everything happens at the right time. And if you're listening to this and you are on the beginning of your journey, probably you needed to hear me say tapping because that's probably a part of your journey. But I, sorry, I'm rambling. Um, I think knowing what your, your stories are and, and what, what tapes you're already playing in your head um, what bullshit life rules you're living through or, or belief systems you're living through and if they're actually yours. Um, a really great book, although if you're at the beginning, it might be a bit advanced, but <laughs> um, Vishen Lakahani wrote a book called Code of the Extraordinary Mind. And I remember reading that and he talks about, you know, how in life we take on other people's belief systems mm. and we call them our own. Um, namely things like religion, you know, laws. I don't encourage breaking the law, but, you know, like Mm -hmm. think to yourself, you know, my universal truth and law is treat others how you want to be treated. That's the rule I follow. So in life, that's what I do. That is it. I don't really follow any other like mindset belief or bullshit rules that anyone else drills into me. Um, I just think, you know, if you can figure out the stories you're telling yourself, you know, like for me, it was a lot about, um, you know, always <laughs> something I grew up with. My dad um, did a bit of life coaching and, and he used to always say to me, you know, always make it about the other person because people love to talk about themselves and they, you know, it'll make them like you more. And he didn't say it in like a like arrogant way. He was just like, you know, it makes people happy. And he said it from a really kind place, but it it gave me an insecurity about talking about myself. Mm. So whenever I would be in a situation where I was in a conversation, I would always bring it back to the other person. How are you? What are you doing? Tell me how you feel about that. Yeah. I just went on a holiday, but where have you been? And, you know, I realized that that was a story I was playing, you know, don't talk about yourself. People won't like you bring it back to them, talk about other people, get them talking about themselves because then they'll like you. So that was a a belief system that I needed to get rid of and I did. And I think that if you can tap into what those systems are for you personally, whether it's around relationships, whether it's around self-belief, whether it's around food, um, you know, if you can figure that out at the beginning, it's going to make your journey a lot easier. Mm -hmm. That's a great spot to start with, those stories in your head. Mm. it's like the little seed that eventually grows into the tree so it's like one of the big pieces to tackle early on so I love that and actually I haven't read that book that you shared so I'm gonna read that one for myself oh he's awesome vision's amazing um I don't know him personally but you know hey vision if you're ever listening hit me up (laughs) um no but he's incredible I read his book um, and he's got a great YouTube channel and and a great he just started a podcast which I'm just loving um nice yeah, he's. I think he's got really great belief systems around, or, or great ways of teaching the right type of belief system, or how to figure out your belief system, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Nice. I'll put those links yeah. in the show notes for the listeners. Are there any other resources that you're loving right now as well? Oh, like so many. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with him. I do love podcasts. Um, I think that they're the best way to learn. I love... Um, Brendan Brashard at the moment. Um, my husband's reading his book, High Performance Habits, mm. um, and we're both going to do his course together. I think 
you know what? I think the right resource will come to you at the right time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think it's kind of creepy how Facebook ads work, but at the same time, like, you know, if something keeps popping up for you, maybe just look into it and see why it's popping up for you and get into it. Be be willing to be a student no matter what that is. And, you know, my resources won't be great for everyone, but you'll hear what you need to hear. And sometimes you'll hear something 20 times. I actually am just this course I'm doing on tapping, I've actually seen the person on Facebook and on ads and I've heard of her several times, but obviously it wasn't until I saw her at, you know, midnight, three nights ago when I decided to sign up (laughs) for her course, it obviously wasn't meant to be until then. And sometimes you'll feel like you're hearing something over and over again. You really need to tune in and go, why am I hearing this again? (laughs) And look a little bit deeper into it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Totally. Because sometimes you definitely need that, that nudge, nudge, like 50 times. And then it's just that one time in the right conditions, you're like, oh, this, this has been like either here the whole time or like, I've never heard it like this, or I've never had this communicated to me like this. And then it all of a sudden clicks. So yeah, it's, um, it's so true. Like it arrives right on time, like in yep. accordance with your journey for sure. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And then lastly, what is your favorite place to connect online? If listeners want to swing by and say hi. I love Instagram <laughs> I love <it> so much. <laughs> I'm a Libra and I love pretty things. So I like, I like pretty pictures. I like making pretty pictures, but you know, if you want to connect and say hi, come over to Facebook because I hate messaging on my phone I feel like my thumbs might fall off one day so I always (laughs) whenever I get a message on Facebook I'm like I'm on my computer and I type really fast and I get back to people whereas on Instagram when I get a message sometimes I'm like oh my poor thumbs I'm gonna get RSI and they're gonna fall off one day so (laughs) I mean if if you want to actually literally say hi um Facebook's always the best place to write a message but yeah I have so much fun on Instagram and I love seeing comments and things like that I always get back to them eventually Um, but definitely head to the website. I mean, that's where you find out everything about what I do and who I am and, you know, all the things. So one of those three, pick your poison. (laughs) Perfect. Sounds good. I'll put all those links in the show notes as well. Thank you. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ange. This time, the time went by so fast. I was looking at the clock. I'm like, what the heck? But thank you so much for coming on. It was an absolute treat and a pleasure to talk to you. And I, I'm so excited that we got to have a two-way conversation. (laughs) Yes, me too. It was so good to connect. So good to talk to you. And there you have it, my friends. That is the show for you today. And thank you so much for coming on the pod and hanging out with us for the hour. It was such a treat to get to talk to you. And if you loved this episode, and if you are as obsessed with Ange and her work as I am, take a second to share it. Share this episode on your Instagram stories, send it to a friend on Twitter, email it to somebody that you know, like needs to hear this message. Because when you send along this kind of message and you share this kind of stuff and these kinds of ideas, you just might light the spark within somebody else. And maybe you have that one friend who like totally needs to hear these words today and just needs that little reminder that everything is possible for their life and that so much of life is working out in our favor as Anne shared. So my friends, I hope you love this episode and until next time, have a lovely day and I will see you back here soon on the pod. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening today. If you love this episode, please take a second to share it with somebody that you know needs to hear this message. And if you feel so called and so moved, please write an honest review of what you think about this podcast in iTunes and leave me some stars. That would truly help me out on my journey to helping millions and millions of people. And until next time, have a lovely day and I'm so excited to see you back here soon. 